Susan Kalman, and I'm a very tense person. Now, a lot of people would probably say that, but let me put that statement into some form of perspective for you. Last week, I was so tense, I found myself getting angry at a pigeon. <laughs> because it was taunting me. Yes. You see, every time I approached a certain stretch of road near my house, I noticed a pigeon sitting in the middle lane, like a fat, feathery Buddha. I would, of course, slow down and wait for the pigeon to move. After a few encounters, I realised it was the same pigeon every single time. And more than that, he looked me straight in the eye as he strutted away. I was playing a game of chicken with a pigeon. <laughs> the mind games continued for weeks. Same pigeon, same strut, until one day I snapped. I got out of my car, got right up in his face and shouted, Know what you're doing, mate? Got all the time in the world. You won't win, you know. You won't win. <laughs> As the pigeon sauntered off, I had to explain to a bus stop full of people that I was simply standing up for myself. <laughs> I now drive a different route. <laughs> this angst isn't a recent development. I've always been a tense person, sometimes with long-lasting and devastating consequences for society. When I was younger, I decided I wanted to learn the timpani. If you don't know what that is, it's the giant kettle drum played by the percussionist at the back of an orchestra. I've no real idea why I was determined to play the largest instrument I could find. Perhaps it's the equivalent of men in their cars. <laughs> I also thought it'd be quite simple, because how hard can it be to twirl some sticks and hit something? The answer is, of course, very hard. <laughs> it turned out that the key to the timpani was not when you played, but when you didn't. In fact, the majority of time is spent counting bars and waiting for your big moment. Sadly, counting is not one of my skills. <laughs> And I spent the weeks prior to the school concert sick with nerves. So much so that by the time the night itself arrived, I was barely able to see. I was sweating so much, I looked like a piece of cheese that had been left out in the sun. <laughs> As you might expect, I lost count after the first minute, panicked, and just started hitting the timpani <laughs> over and over again, randomly with no musicality whatsoever. <laughs> My parents quietly withdrew me from further lessons. <laughs> the true tragedy of this story is not the fact that the first violin ended up in tears. No, it's that this country was robbed of the next Evelyn Glennie. <laughs> <laughs> Events like this dogged me into my adult years, and to be honest, I was strangely proud of myself. I like to think I was quirky, eccentric, if you will, sadly. It seems that far from being a character in an Amistad mopping book, I'm actually just a little bit annoying. <laughs> I just wish you weren't so tense all the time. It's not endearing to worry about the Christmas driving weather in July. <laughs> it's nice, isn't it? It's my wife. Honesty is very important in a relationship, especially towards the end. <laughs> I knew a change needed to happen, but that caused even more worry because I'm not that good at change. I still call a Snickers a marathon. I still call Sif by its proper name, Jif. And I still open a can of soup the old-fashioned way, even if there's a newfangled ring pool on it. But for the sake of my sanity and my marriage, I knew that change was necessary. I love you, I love you, I really love you, I love you so much. I just wish you were someone else. <laughs> For the purposes of this series, I decided to undertake four activities, each of which have been suggested to help me relax and achieve my aim of ultimate zen. I've asked four friends who claim to find relaxation in an activity that they love to take me along with them and show me how to enjoy it too, against my better judgement. I approached each activity with an open mind. Which is a lie, of course I didn't. <laughs> if I'd wanted to do any of these stupid things, I would have done them years ago. Take the focus of this episode. Cricket. <laughs> Before I get into the meat of the experiment in detail, let me try to explain why cricket does not immediately spring to mind as a relaxing activity for me. Number one. It seems rather, well, English. <laughs> now, I hate stereotypes, based on nationality. Personally, I've never had a deep-fried Mars bar, nor do I want one. 
I don't own any albums by Lulu, <laughs> nor do I want one. <laughs> and I don't hate the English. For goodness sakes, my sister owns one, so he's married to one. <laughs> My family is the epitome of cross-border cooperation, and if you can't tell that by looking at us vocally, it's immediately obvious. My niece lives in the East End of London and speaks with a Cockney accent. At three years old, she sounds like Dick Van Dyke on helium. <laughs> Auntie Susan! Auntie Susan! Can we sing Let It Go again? <laughs> Yes, we can. When you can talk about Scottish history. <laughs> you know, something from way back, like Bonnie Prince Charlie, or Mary Queen of Scots, or Scottish Labour. <laughs> Political jibes aside, I'm not in the news quiz now, uh, <laughs> let me be clear about my first point. Some people in Scotland play cricket. Some people enjoy cricket. Cricket is not banned on the basis it seems very English, but I think it's fair to say that compared to some other sporting activities in my homeland, it's not the most commonly watched or played. I spoke to a number of friends who find cricket relaxing, and a recurring theme to them was that cricket was the sound of their childhood. Hearing the smack of the ball against the... stick... <laughs> immediately made them feel happy and safe, like they were back at their mum and dad's in the long, hot summer months. But these friends were mostly English or Australian. When I asked Scottish friends what they remember of summers, they said the theme tune to Glen Michael's Cavalcade. <laughs> and no, I don't care that most of you don't know what that is. <laughs> Radio 4 is a UK-wide station, and I'm sending that out to the McMassive. <laughs> Number two, does anything ever happen? <laughs> I don't know the rules of cricket, but I've never thought that seemed to matter. If I'm honest, in the small doses I've experienced of the game, nothing really seems to happen. For example, in the unfortunate half hour I recall watching, all I saw was a man throwing a ball at another man who kept ducking. <laughs> again and again and again. No one else moved on the field. I don't even know if the people on the pitch were meant to be there or if that particular game was just so uneventful, spectators could just wander on <laughs> for a closer look at a man ducking for half an hour. If I had to describe cricket, you know, to an alien who'd just landed on Earth, I'd say, it's a game in which no one scores anything for hours and people don't move. It's like watching a bus queue that happens to be spread out on a field. <laughs> the problem is that instead of relaxing me, this complete lack of activity makes me feel even more tense. I like things that distract me from everyday worries, that can make me forget all of the other things that make me want to cry on a daily basis. I like sport with passion. The last time I went to see a football match, it was Scotland against Italy. When Scotland scored, a man beside me swept me into his arms and kissed me passionately and I let him do it. <laughs> Twice. <laughs> I can't imagine a stranger trying to snog me because someone bounced a ball and a man ducked. <laughs> what on earth is the point of a game that goes on for five days and no one wins it? <laughs> Can something go on for so long without a decent conclusion? It's the same feeling I got when I watched the television show Lost. <laughs> I'm aware of the fact some of you may not get that reference, but I like to reward box set lovers for their long service. <laughs> Especially those of us who've continued with a show, even when it's long past its best. You know, shows that should have been cancelled years ago, like Heroes. Dexter and Piers Morgan's life stories. <laughs> Number three, maths. Cricket seems to me to be a largely arithmetical activity. To put my feelings into an equation, anything plus maths equals minus fun. They're 264 for three after 12 overs. <laughs> Hate maths. I just don't see the point in being good at counting. Other people are good at counting. My accountant's a lovely woman who takes on with the numbers in my life and makes sense of them. I don't want to deprive her of that fun. I'm creating jobs. 
I'm better than the government. <laughs> I do not find maths relaxing. To me, the thought of combining maths with fun is as bad as putting vomit into a vol of all. <laughs> My disinterest in the sport, the maths, and the seeming lack of action all combined to make this quest one of the most difficult I undertook in this series. If I'm honest, I was almost completely convinced it would be unsuccessful. It was a brave soul who undertook the task of being my guide. Andy Zaltzman, comedian, writer, and all-round lovely fellow, was the man for me. And I knew it was the correct decision when... I prefer cricket to life. Uh, I think it's better in most ways. It's better than, than reality, and that's one of the great things about cricket. I mean, if you look at the news, it's, I mean, it's really bad, really, really awful, and cricket gives you an escape from that for an extremely long time. <laughs> five days off from news, from any form of personal difficulties, from disputes with your loved ones, tax demands, legal summons. You can just set them all aside and allow yourself to be enveloped by the sinuous narratives of Test Cricket, Susan. I warned Andy before we started of all my concerns and we settled on a strategy. We agreed that because of my temperament, grumpy, knowledge, minimal, and bladder control, terrible, he should treat me as if I was his six-year-old child. And so the day out with me and my new cricket dad started. And we went big. My first ever experience of cricket was to attend the opening day of the Ashes Test at Lord's Cricket Ground. To show my willingness, I took it very seriously and had done my research. Who are they playing? Right, so what you're seeing here is England against Australia. Right. A cricketing rivalry as old as time itself, uh, if you think that time began in 1877, which... <laughs> uh, it's the oldest, uh, one of the oldest rivalries in any international sport. It's been going on you know, 140 years almost. So this, I would say it's not only the most important rivalry in cricket, uh, probably in the entire universe. Uh, and, uh, I mean, you're seeing the very best here. Good, well, now at least I know who to cheer for. England, of course, what'd you take me for? <laughs> we arrived at the ground and everything seemed civilised enough. The gentleman who checked my bag at security was quite confused by my attendance. I wrote down our conversation. Security man, where are you from? Me, Glasgow. Did you come from there this morning? Well, last night, actually, I got the overnight train. For the cricket. <laughs> Yes, am I the only Scottish woman you've ever encountered who's got the sleeper train down specially to watch England play in the ashes? Yep. <laughs> Have a lovely day. <laughs> Back to the task. I thought it might help if I understood what was happening. And is it who wins the most overs? No, it's not that, no. Damn it. No. <laughs> so I thought I'd got no, it's it. not done on a round, it's not like boxing on a round by round thing. Maybe that's something that cricket could, could maybe So if they say someone is 150 for five. Yes. What does that, that mean? That means the batsmen have scored 150 runs between them, plus extras, so let's not go into What's that. What's the five mean? That's five people out. You, you've got 11 players on the team. You finish when 10 of them are out. So that's half. <laughs> that's going first. So that's not a good score, generally. That not wouldn't a be a score. good score. No, 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 absolutely not. OK, so... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> are you a maths fan? No, see, maybe this right. is the Right, that could be a bit of a stumbling block, to be honest. OK. <laughs> so the numbers are great. They're, so, they're awesome. who, someone bats first. Yes. Let's say England are batting first. Yeah. And they're all out when all of the batsmen have been caught out. Yes, but one of them is left not out. Uh, okay. Let's, yeah, we're getting into And out. does it just stop at the end of the day and that's them, or do they just carry on until Oh, no, then the right? other team will come in. Well, they finish the day after, you know, six, seven hours played. Oh, I think they're going in. Do you want oh. to go in? Do you want to go in? Should we go in? That's the I... toss. That's the toss. That's the toss. Yeah, they're going to have to toss. So they toss a coin at the start of the match. That giant roar was for the toss. Yeah, well, that's the thing. It's still half an hour before the start. You've got 30,000 people wanting to know what happens to a coin. I mean, where else do you get that? <laughs> I hate to admit it, but I did zone out a bit when he was explaining the rules. He sounded a bit like the teacher in Charlie Brown, you know. <laughs> My mind was still resisting the complex nature of what was happening. See, football is easy. If you get it in the goal, it's a goal. The person that gets the most goals wins. Rugby similar. But Andy kept going about test cricket like it was a living, breathing thing. Well, a lot of people compare a test match to a novel. You know, that was unfolding stories, uh, characters, subplots, but you know, I think test matches are better than novels. Because we can 
the novel, you can just read the, read the last chapter. Right? Yes, yes. That's my job to wait. I'll yeah. wait five days. Yeah. See what happens. To be fair, when you hear someone talk with such intensity about something, you can't help but listen to them. Maybe there was another level to this. Perhaps I've been looking at this too simplistically. The way Andy was talking about the ashes was like Dallas, but with balls. <laughs> I had to make this work, though. I had to relax. We took our seats and I surveyed the scene. It's a curious thing to be in the crowd at a test match. The man next to me was reading a book, according to Andy. That was perfectly normal. It's entirely reasonable, indeed encouraged, to take a newspaper or a novel to read to keep you occupied while absolutely nothing is happening <laughs> on the pitch. I think it's fair to say, if I'd gone to a football match and whipped out my copy of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, I would have got some funny looks. Not at the cricket. I'd probably have received some knowing nods or glances of admiration from fellow muggles. <laughs> A group of businessmen behind me were intent on playing, oh, I've got a bigger corporate entertaining account than you. <laughs> and amused themselves, reeling off the sporting events they'd attended and rating them not according to the game, but according to just how drunk they'd got. And there were a lot of people getting very, very drunk at the cricket and far more ostentatiously than at any rugby match I've attended. But what was more interesting to me was what they were drinking. No cans of lager, no buckfast tonic wine. Instead, it seemed that the majority of spectators were getting hammered into vats of champagne and pims. I've never before been in a sporting crowd where the main danger is being hit by a cork. <laughs> Interestingly, despite the increasing amounts of alcohol being consumed, there was no real aggression from the crowd, despite the mediocre performance of the England team during the morning session. I say they were mediocre, like I knew what was happening. I'm just repeating what Andy said. In football, if a team is performing badly, you can usually rely on the team's own supporters to vociferously suggest they get off their arse and do something about it. <laughs> At Lord's, the worst thing I heard was a man quietly mumbling, he's aiming too far offside there, he really needs to do better. <laughs> Steady on there, fella. It was almost as though the lack of action was part of a mass hypnosis, leading tens of thousands of people not to care what was happening. It wasn't boring. I mean, it wasn't like when I was forced to watch Peppa Pig for what seemed like 97 hours with my niece. Watch Peppa Pig with me, Auntie Susan! <laughs> for the record, I think Belinda Bear and Simon Squirrel can take teasing too far. <laughs> the cricket was relaxing, and it was almost like Andy had a point. So when you arrive somewhere like this, do you automatically think, right, that's me away from everything? I'm in for a relaxing day. You know, as soon yes. as you come in and sit down, is it kind of like, right, yes. this is it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you can quite easily shut off everything. I guess with in the mobile era, it's there's a risk of getting looking at your phone and checking emails and stuff. But it's quite easy to blot everything out and just you know just sit there concentrating on what is essentially totally irrelevant. Yeah. I think it's mentally very refreshing. Okay. Particularly if you happen to be very busy. A, good, a day watching or playing cricket is worth about three days holiday. Really? Yeah. <laughs> well, not necessarily the most romantic holiday, but... <laughs> Yeah. If you both enjoy cricket, it would be. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. It's like I like model railways, so I right. take my wife to model railway exhibitions. Right. Well, I think if you like model railways, there's a statistically quite a good chance you could learn to like cricket. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to let everything go by watching nothing. This was difficult for me to comprehend. I've always equated lack of productivity with being slovenly, but I made an effort emptied my mind of the concerns and worries that usually race around and concentrated on nothing. And slowly, but surely, a curious thing started to happen. As soon as I started to think about the actual game, to try and understand the tactics and the backstory, I began to forget the things that were worrying me. Andy's excellent tutelage meant I was becoming quite the expert. I could tell the difference between the spin bowlers and the fast bowlers. I could see why the fielders were positioned where they were. And then a miracle happened. Someone got out. <laughs> I missed the actual event, to be fair, because earlier in the game, I thought someone was caught out and cheered when it turned out that nothing happened. <laughs> the ball and cricket is very tiny, and clearly my eyes aren't attuned to it. 
I was so embarrassed by my obvious and loud faux pas, I was determined not to cheer unless I was completely sure that something had definitely happened. But now, after a second of hesitation, I was certain something had definitely happened. And I joined in the jubilant celebrations of the crowd. By jubilant, I mean clapping. Yes, clapping. If there's one thing I learned, it's that clapping is very much the way forward at cricket. Have you practised your clapping? Yes. If you're not used to coming to cricket, yeah. then it's the endurance, mild <laughs> applause over the course of seven hours. The applause was almost constant, and strangely, people were clapping, even when the teams didn't actually do anything good. I work in an industry where I work hard for an audible confirmation that I'm doing my job properly. An applause-breaking comedy is rare, and stand-ups fight hard to get an audience to clap. In this amphitheatre of sport, the crowd were willing to put their hands together for almost anything. <laughs> After a few hours, it seemed the most normal thing in the world to say, well done, at least you tried. <laughs> I yearn for a gig where an audience applauds every attempt at a joke because it's a nice thing to do. <laughs> That's a bit enthusiastic for the cricket, because the cricket claps were... So you just carry on talking and you just kind of do that. So we'll try a cricket clap, do that. That's a cricket clap! <laughs> Preferred the first one. <laughs> As lunch was called, I had a terrible realisation. I'd started to enjoy cricket. I, I, I learned how to make the noises as well. I'll just do some of them for you. Oh! <laughs> oh! <laughs> It's just a combination of that with the clever. Oh. I was grateful for the break from the game and keen to enjoy what is next to drinking one of the most important aspects of visiting a test match, the food. I had been told that most people bring a picnic to a test match, but I decided not to because picnics are not relaxing. I mean, I sometimes take a picnic on a long train journey, but the, the last time I did that, the train didn't even make it out of the station before I'd stuffed it in my mouth. <laughs> I'm not that keen on the concept of picnicking. I don't like eating on the floor. And let's be honest, grass is just a floor with an organic carpet. That's all it is. I don't like sandwiches if someone else has made them. I dislike scotch eggs and sausage rolls or any sausage-based products. I don't like fancy crisps. I just like a packet of ready salted. I hate fruit juice. And I certainly would not thank you for a quiche. If you gave me a quiche, I would hand it back to you and say, no, thank you. I do not want your egg pie. <laughs> If you're familiar with my work, you may be thinking, but what about the toilets, Susan? <laughs> Tell us about the toilets. <laughs> if you don't know already, I've become incredibly stressed thinking about toilets, not the actual vessel itself, rather about the lack of them or the fact they might be in poor repair. I'm pleased to report that Lords is one of the only large-scale public events I've ever attended where there was no queue for the ladies. <laughs> the main event. We took our seats for the after lunch session and the game continued much like before. I now understood all of the rules of cricket so knew that 85 for one after 18 overs wasn't that scintillating. But nothing changed. There seemed to be no real imperative to speed up. Throw the ball, avoid the ball, throw the ball, avoid the ball, repeat to fade. And as always it seemed that it wasn't necessary to really pay attention to what was happening. A gentle, gentle hum of chat. That's... Yeah. That's, that's the true sound of cricket. It's quite strange because if you watch tennis or yeah. other sports, there's silence. Yes. For when they play. Yeah. But here it's people are chatting while they're. Yeah. Mild hubbub. Yes. Yeah. <gasps> the game fell into a rhythm. The crowd gently conversed and slowly but surely I started to fall asleep. <laughs> Not a deep sleep, but one of those lovely dozies you sometimes have on a you know, warm day when you're lying on the sofa, the window's open, a gentle breeze blows by, but you happen to be in a sunbeam so you're warm and safe and a cat snores gently beside you and you know everything's okay in the world. And that's when I gave in. To put it simply, cricket had worn me out and was achieving what little else had. I was truly, completely and utterly relaxed. And I got it, I understood it. In many ways, cricket is absolutely the definition of perfection for me. Food, check. Toilets, check. Alcohol, check. 
Even the lack of activity started to appeal. It turns out that cricket is a metaphorical etch-a-sketch, wiping my brain of worry. Before the game started, I was concerned I'd be bored because of the lack of action. It turns out the lack of action is what is so very relaxing. <laughs> I was at a crossroads. I could fight it, rail against this discovery, refusing to accept what was clearly good for me. Or I could bow to the inevitable. Do you think it's just basically a way of killing time before the merciful release of the Reaper? Is that just something we've invented? Well, I have, to ease well, the I have really enjoyed it. Yeah. It's almost hypnotic. But we have sat there for a number of hours. Yes. And for about five minutes, something happened. Yes. And that's not bad for a day's cricket. I think as a day out, it's yeah. really excellent. Yes. And I actually feel more relaxed than I have in a very long time. Right, it's done its job. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just try it more in Scotland. <laughs> I don't know about the, um, the game itself. I think you need to give it time. I think you need to look on this as a, like a starter day. Even as a hardcore fundamentalist cricket fan, yeah. I would grant you that was not the most action-packed yeah. day that you could have yeah. seen. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think it's a positive start. It's oh, going it's a lot better than I was I expecting. I thought I would hate it. Yeah. I said I was open-minded. I lied. Yeah. And actually, it has been one of the most enjoyable days I've had in a very long time. Right. This is wonderful news, Susan. I believe huge new vistas of time-wasting have opened up for you. Yeah. <laughs> what did I do? I did what I never thought I would. The very next day I went home, switched on the wireless, and listened to the next day of the test. And the next. And the next. And as I did so, I remembered snoozing in the sun next to my cricket dad, the hum of conversation, the polite applause and the clean toilets. And in the maelstrom of fear that is my life, there was an island of calm, clothed in white and smelling of willow. The wood, that is, not the character in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. <laughs> I, I don't know what she smells of. <laughs> Probably the sexual awakening of a thousand bi-curious 90s teenagers. <laughs> My name is Susan Kalman, and I don't like cricket. I love it. <laughs> Keep Calm and Carry On was written by me, Susan Kalman, with thanks to Andy Zaltzman. The producer was Lindsay Fenner, and it was a BBC Radio comedy production. <laughs>